This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good early evening and late afternoon, dear listeners. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you're listening to the Sunday Afternoon Twilight Show with Maud. It is 5 p.m. on Sunday, the 8th of October, and you can join me using the chat function. We can discuss today's topic, which is good quality training for teachers. Welcome! This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Good afternoon, or shall I say early evening, fellow educators and dear listeners. This is my drum roll, 50th radio show as your hostess, and I'm delighted to share this anniversary in your company. But first, I have to introduce myself for any potential new listener. I am Maud, a French citizen of French and West African ancestry. I have been living in the United Kingdom since August 2008, and I am a professional educator. I currently work in a secondary state school in North London, where I teach languages, and I also work in a nursery um, for the charity sector at the weekend. You can follow me on X Twitter at Prof Prof MFL. All views are my own. Today, I want to focus on one topic that is very relevant and fresh in my mind to me as an educator. It's how to provide good quality training for teachers and why do teachers need it? So, this is mostly relevant to, obviously, teachers, um, but the people who also provide training for them. Um, By extension, anyone working as a legislator regarding education, so people working in exam boards, working for the Department for Education, Ofqual, and Ofsted, by extension. It might be of interest to parents and uh, students. Finally, people interested in education and the curious and well-informed. So, um, it is obviously a special podcast because it's my 50th, but it is also a special circumstance, set of circumstance, because I've just arrived back from a trip. I took off after my last lesson on Friday, and I made my way all the way north towards Manchester. Why did I go to Manchester after a long week of working in a classroom in London? Well, it's because I couldn't miss a special occasion, and this occasion was the Teach Meet Modern Foreign Languages Icon face-to-face event. So what is this? Well, it happened on Saturday the 7th of October, and it's a special event, uh, the premiere of Teach Meet for UK MFL teachers. So this is a lot of acronym, but basically it means that it is a tailored event for people who teach languages with in attendance, mostly people who teach languages, but also people who provide resources for uh, language teachers. And it was organized by Tom Rogers, Adam Lamb and Kathy, and all these people are teachers and they work full time, but they really want to provide the best training for teachers. And what could be better as training than something provided by teachers who are spending Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in a classroom with real students facing the real challenges that all teachers face at the minute. Um, So this was a wonderful event and if you've missed it, it was recorded so you could check it out on most social media. 
but I just wanted to talk about the value of such events today. So first I have to also um, inform you that these events cost money to organize even though all the speakers did it without being paid a fee and they were coming as volunteers. But you still need a lot of money for renting a room uh, it was at the Quakers' house in Manchester, by the way. Uh, you need money for um, food, provision. You also, it was not charged. So the, the teachers who came had to pay a ticket, but they that included their food. So basically, it was a free event. And the sponsors were Pearson, an American company that provides learning and teaching resources, and also Oxford University Press, very famous publishing press, uh, publishing house in the UK. So thanks to the two sponsors, we we could have this event um, in Manchester. Now, the people who came as volunteers and spoke were some of them very new to the profession, and some of them have actually retired, but still love languages so much that they still work for the benefit of all. So the speakers were uh, Helen Myers, most people who teach languages know, know who Ellen Myers is. And uh, we will start by listening, I mean, by thinking about what her contributions have been over the years. So Helen Myers also is a contributor to the Association for Language Learning, and she is the person who reads absolutely everything that's published by exam boards, by the Department for Education, and by Ofqual regarding MFL and modern foreign languages. So people jokingly call her a guru of MFL or the legend of MFL. I'm going to call her the, the Dame Judy Dench of um, language learning in the UK because she's been working for more than 35 years in that field. She's passionate. She gave it all. Basically, every every time I go to a conference, she's already there. And um, she's inspirational. So Helen Myers um, has created, out of the kindness of her heart, because she's retired, but she has created a Google Drive that she shares with anyone who's interested in accessing it, in which she has been, obviously, sampling all the sample assessment materials that were made by exam boards. And she's read them all, and she's made... Um, documents summarizing the changes so it's a lot of work it's 250 pages she's read and summarized but it's really important for teachers because we are facing very complex exams if you ask any parents who's had children who did their a levels or gcses lately they will tell you that there's so many different types of exams it's more than 27 exams that children age 15 16 have to do so it's a lot of work now who chooses to make the, these exams who's the guilty culprit well it's ofqual and the dfe so the department for education and um, these institutions are controlled by the government so we don't have much say as far as teachers, classroom teachers are concerned on the way our students are evaluated and assessed. The exam boards are just following guidelines printed and given by Ofqual and the DfE. So it is definitely a very centralized, heavy and rigid uh, governmental structure. Now, they make the decisions and as classroom teachers, we just have to bow and uh, apply them. So, not much change has happened since the new uh, revision of um, MFL exams. Basically, um, we are told that cultural input is still very important when we teach a language, yet, once more, none of the cultural aspect of the language is assessed in the exams. So guess what happens in a classroom? Well, the teachers are going to mention some cultural aspects, but if it's not assessed, they're going to not devote that much time over it because they'll have to work on the skills that are assessed. So once again, I think it's a shame that we are not teaching children uh, the history of the country or the history of the people who are speaking the language they're learning. So languages are officially a very hard 
in the UK, not particularly because it's challenging to learn, but because the the way because of the way they are graded. So it is official now. It's been uh, accepted by the Department for Education and published in many reports that languages are marked in a harsher way than other subjects. So the science, the math, the English papers will not have a grading system that's as harsh as languages. Why is this? Nobody can tell you why, but this is the reality. So languages are marked uh, through the grading in a more severe way than in any other subjects. Uh, the Association for Language Learning has been complaining about this for 20 years now, and you can see that the message hasn't been spread enough because there's been no consequences. So Helen Myers described that the vocabulary list that teachers have to teach their students has been chosen in a very peculiar way. You would assume that they would choose the list, the most commonly words, used words that any 15 years old in the world would use. You would assume that it would be words such as trainers, sports clothes, mobile phone, Uh, name of animals, name of colors, name of jobs, name, vocabulary of working at school, obviously, but so uh, maybe travel, traveling, planes, computer games, etc. What interests a teenager? You would assume that these would be the words chosen by the Department for Education. Well, no. The list of words that all UK students have to learn whether it's Spanish, French or German, was taken from, wait for it, a parliament in Canada. I know, this feels strange, doesn't it? So basically, we selected, I mean, when I say we, I mean the Department for Education, selected 1,000, let's say 1,500 words that were the most used words at the Canadian Parliament during debates. And that list, however random that decision was, has been given to teachers to use. So 80% of these words are usually social um, terminology that are used in debates, but that will not surprise you. But the word chicken, for instance, and the word shirt do not appear in debates at the Canadian Parliament, so they have not been added to the list. Can you imagine learning a language and not having to learn the word chicken or shirt and never being asked, asked anything about a chicken or a shirt? This is very ordinary vocabulary. So from the start, when I was told that this was a decision made by this institution, I thought that the world had gone mad. But here we go, and this is what we have to do. So we need to work even harder now to make all the students learn that random list that was chosen. Only four animals on that list, whereas usually children love to talk about animals. So a lot of memorizing and a lot of teaching how to memorize is going to have to be done. It's always been done, by the way, because you can't learn a language without learning vocabulary. But now it's going to be difficult because obviously it's not always the most commonly used words for teenagers. As far as grammar is concerned, the new GCSE for languages does not contain any difficult tenses anymore, such as subjunctive and pluperfect. For instance, I would have liked to blah, 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 blah. So the students don't have to learn I would have liked anymore. Now, what we have to focus on is the other tenses. And believe me, there's enough in Spanish and French to occupy children for more than 10 years. Some weird um, decisions have been made. For instance, the word écrire is not on the list um, for some exam boards, but the word inscribe is instead. So we have to accept these quirks and just make them work for our students. The job of the teacher will be to work on derivational morphology, 
that's quite a mouthful. This means just teaching the students how you can take a root word and then add prefixes and suffixes to make it into a different word. For instance, you've got the root word soft, you could add li, softly, and it becomes an adverb. And you teach the students how to do that in a foreign language. Fortunate, you can say misfortunate, you can say unfortunate, you can say fortunately. So we're the same root, fortune, you can have plenty more new words. As usual, um, language teachers will have to insist on pronunciation and phonics, which is something they already do. Now, there'll be some different variations in the uh, writing papers for GCSE. Um, still some multiple choice questions, still some quizzes. Um, a translation will still be there, but marked a little bit less harshly hopefully. And um, there will be a focus on understanding and communicating a meaning rather than being perfect in the way we transcribe the sentence. So hopefully that will help the students. Now, there's very big differences between the exam boards, uh, AQA, which is a charity, and Edexcel, which is a private company. So AQA offers two repetitions for the listening papers and the questions are shorter and the exam will only last 35 minutes whereas edexcel offers three potential listening repeats so you can play the same uh, message three times but the exam will last 45 minutes a bit longer and um, the questions will be on longer segments of text. So it is about your school and your department to choose which uh, exam board you prefer to that respect. Um, the best way to prepare um, our students for the listening is not an easy task. I would say it has to be done halfway at home and halfway in the classroom. So basically to improve your listening skills, you need to watch a lot of TV in the language you're learning. And this can only be done in your spare time as a child. So if you're a parent of a student who does a GCSE, tell your, your children to use um, movies they like. I recommend using any, um, uh, any movies from Netflix or from BBC iPlayer or Disney, any any uh, movie, but with the language. So, for instance, if you're learning Spanish, put the Spanish audio, and at if you if you really want to push it, put the subtitles in Spanish, and then watch your favorite movies that you already know very well, so that you're not uh, feeling like you're missing out on the plot. So you can rewatch all the classics, but in the language you're learning. So this is how you practice listening. If you want to support your students to practice listening in class, give them transcript or any texts. Ask them to follow with their index finger while they listen to uh, the recording audio file of the same text. So basically, it's like using um, audiobooks. It's the best way with the text in front of you. And that's just to train your ear to understand what the word looks like and sounds like and compare. Um, for speaking, we haven't changed the exam at all, really. Um, it's still the same sort of exam, still role play, except the bullet points will be in English which takes away one difficulty, one layer of difficulty. So your students will have all the instructions in English and they will just have to prepare their sentences in French, which I think avoids a misunderstanding in the role play. Self-correction is as always encouraged and the last utterance will be taken into account. So for instance, if your student says, um, la maison est petite, and then realizes that maison is feminine, they, they need to add an E at the adjectives ending. And they say, uh, la maison est petit, uh, petite, they will get um, a good grade if they self-corrected, which I think is how we can encourage self-correction. And this is how we learn to speak a language anyway. There is a new part to the speaking task, and that's the only new thing, really. There will be a reading out loud part. 
So a small, maybe two or three sentences will be asked, given to the child and the child will have to read it out loud. And then there will be a question about the text, but regarding the student's personal life. So for instance, if the three sentences are about someone celebrating their birthday, after that, there will be a question, qu'est-ce que tu aimes faire pour ton anniversaire? What do you like to do for your birthday? So this is the only new thing really in the speaking. The photo description doesn't change. Uh, AQA is still too cheap to provide uh, photos with colors, which really irks me. I mean, in 2023, you would, you would assume that an exam board could provide printed photocopies in color for students, but you know, Maybe I asked too much. Uh, Edexcel provides pictures in color, so that's something to be um, to praise Edexcel for. Um, now the writing exams won't be that different either. Um, there will be less bullet points, only three instead of four, um, and um, that's for AQA. Two tenses instead of three or four, and for Edexcel there's four bullet points but three tenses. And all the instructions are given in English, which I, I hope will help the students. For the translation part, um, we are understanding a bit more that children really like fairness and it's not fair to take a whole mark off for just one mistake in a sentence. So the translation is going to be marked in a fairer way. Perfection is no longer required, but communication is key. So if you understand what the sentence was about, mostly you will still get your mark, even though you made a slight mistake. So advice from Helen Myers concerning this new GCSE exam format. Well, it's not a revolutionary change, so don't panic. Keep doing the good job you do as a teacher throughout the, the, the term. So teach your students the topics. They're usually the same. So traveling, environment, my hobbies, um, celebrations, and my school life. Um, then work on pronunciation. And I think I do it a lot, a lot because I'm a native speaker, but it's important that we never let the students get away with not so accurate pronunciation. We really need to teach them to pronounce the sounds the way they are uh, to avoid misunderstanding. And also because it's um, accuracy is good in pronunciation. Otherwise the, the French people you're gonna talk to or the Spanish people you're gonna talk to won't understand. And uh, the last piece of advice from Helen uh, to prepare the students for that new GCSE was, uh, again, to work on the listening by using a transcript, playing the audio file, and making the children read through at the same time. So we could call that scaffolded uh, listening practice. So that was for um, Helen Meyer's intervention at the Teach Meet um, event. Now we're going to listen to the news before we hear about the other speakers and what little nuggets of knowledge they shared with us. So let's uh, hear the news. Teaching is a rewarding profession, but it comes with its fair share of challenges. That's where ADAPT come in. We're not your typical trade union, but instead a modern, apolitical alternative, offering expert legal, employment and mental health support, protection, without the politics. So what makes EDAPT different? We're always apolitical and independent, specialised solely in supporting individual teachers. Our caseworkers are professionally qualified, ensuring you always get the best advice. Plus, there's 24-7 mental health support. Whether it's a simple contract check or handling serious allegations, EDAPT are here for you. Join the thousands of educators who've chosen EDAPT to protect their careers. Subscribe at adapt.org.uk today. Adapt. Supporting school staff. Protecting careers. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Schools may have to redraw budgets for the next academic year after what the BBC describes as a blunder by the Department for Education. 
a miscalculation came about because the number of pupils was underestimated. An original plan of a 2.7% increase per pupil in England for the academic year 2024 to 25 has now had to be revised to 1.9%. The government has ordered an inquiry and issued an apology. In a letter to the Education Select Committee, the DfE stressed that this was not a reduction to the total school's budget, but said the amount promised had to be recalculated because an undiscovered error made by DfE officials during initial calculations. The BBC calculated that keeping the original planned increase of 2.7% would have meant the government having to find a further £370 million to top up the overall school's budget. Jeff Barton, General Secretary of the Association of School and College Leaders, said the error was unfortunate and frustrating and that it was likely that trusts and local authorities will have used the incorrect figures and will now need to revise budgets. A-levels and T-levels will be replaced by a new qualification for school leavers in England, according to new plans announced by PM Rishi Sunak. The plans reported across media outlets would see 16 to 19 year olds study around five subjects as part of the so-called advanced British standard, including some maths to 18. The plans prompted many to question how this would be delivered, but Mr Sunak said that more teachers would be recruited and that changes would be aimed at pupils who were currently only just starting primary schools. He also announced that the changes would see students spend 195 hours more with a teacher. He also promised an additional £600 million over two years to increase training of maths teachers and funding for those studying for compulsory GCSE resits in colleges in maths and English. The plans will go to consultation for possible implementation around 2033-34. to 34. But with a general election on the horizon, many may feel they are unlikely to happen should there be a change in government. The early years and primary sectors have responded to reports in the Times that children will have to brush their teeth under supervision in schools. According to the paper, Labour is planning to use schools and nurseries to help save NHS dentistry and that the party would introduce supervised toothbrushing in schools for children aged three to five. And this would be prioritised in areas with the highest incidence of childhood tooth decay. Whilst dental associations and charities welcomed the proposals, Paul Whiteman of the NAHT said the union had serious reservations about how such a policy could even work and that it is not the role of teachers to make sure children brush their teeth. Schools Week reports on comments made by Amanda Spielman, Chief Inspector of Schools in England, at the Confederation of Schools Trust's annual conference. Ms Spielman was responding to questions about a rise in complaints to Ofsted about schools. In 2017-18, to 18, there were around 11,500 complaints, but in 2021-22, to 22, this had risen to almost 15,000. Ms Spielman said that post-Covid people were grumpier and have a greater propensity to put pen to paper, but the complaints leading to early inspection numbers weren't any higher than previously. She said there was no question more complaints were coming through, but that she was sceptical it reflected any real change. In Wales, the BBC reports on an ongoing school-run parking route. Residents of a street in Bridge End say issues at pick-up and drop-off times are persisting 18 months after a protest saw people living in a cul-de-sac blocking the road. They describe the scene outside of a nearby primary school as carnage, and claim cars and property have been damaged. Residents have been blocked in their driveways, and this has led to rising tempers. This is a perennial problem across the country for many who live near primary schools. The row in Wales is unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. Finally, student housing has made the news again this week, this time in Salford, where, according to BBC Local News, a major student letting company has been accused of falsifying a tenant's signature on a document to defend a property's filthy conditions. The company is alleged to have added the signature to a waiver saying tenants were aware the property had outstanding maintenance when they moved in. But tenants said they had been told issues would be resolved beforehand. Upon arrival, they discovered a broken fire door, a boarded up window and slugs and cockroach infestations. 
an investigation into the allegations of forgery has been launched. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Thank you for listening to the news, dear listeners. Um, now, I just want to go back to how important it is to let teachers organize their own training because they know exactly what they need and it's good to also be uh, able to network and this is the the whole point of going to this event in manchester organized by uh, teach meet it's to be able to hear from other people who walk the walk and know exactly how uh, teaching is now there was not just people with a lot of experience at um, at this event because Helen Myers has been um, in the MFL world for more than 35 years. There was much younger um, professionals who've been there just a, a couple of years and also some who were a little bit more established. So very, very different people at a different stage in their career. Um, I want to um, salute um, Francesca Garrity, who is head of MFL, and she was uh, coming to talk about her little strategy. It's called Five a Day. And obviously, if you are um, into um, challenges, you can go as, uh, as far as 10 a day. But for her, Five a Day is um, not about eating fruits and vegetables although it's inspired by it. It's just as healthy for the mind, though. It's five words a day keeps intervention away. So her strategy is to drill vocabulary so that the children get into the habit of adding more words as they go. Uh, and it's to choose words that are meaningful for the students. So here, Francesca is going a little bit against that random parliamentary debate list given by um, the Department for Education and Ofqual. She wants to find words that are relevant for students to express themselves and also words that are meaningful to them. So she sometimes lets them choose and also she gets them so that they're on topic. But she makes them use color codes for retrieval, for memorizing. Uh, she uses a certain color for words that they've seen uh, recently and for words that they have um, not seen for a while, she uses a different color. But the, the aim is to add the number of words that the children are familiar with. And I think it's a very good idea to tell the children, let's have our five a day, let's make a little list, maybe have a vocabulary book that they keep in the classroom where they add their five a day. Uh, obviously, it's ideal if you see the students a lot. If you see them once a fortnight, it might not be five a day. It won't work the, um, the name of the... It might be five a time. I, I don't know. But this is something that can be easily impl implemented in any classroom. Now, there was also um, people who came to speak who are not teachers, and these were the people were part of the sponsors staff role. So we had someone from Pearson um, who came and um, offered some guidance to prepare the students for the new GSCSE exams. Uh, she did say that um, it was a bit sad. I mean, my opinion is that it's sad, but there would be no more authentic novel extracts in the, in the reading uh, test, which I think is sad because I know it was challenging for the students, but it was it was a bit, you know, bringing some authenticity, I think, is definitely lacking in the way we teach languages in the UK. We should not wait to be in A-level to, to read um, actual books that are published in French. I'm not saying the whole book, but just an extract. So to me, that was um, a bit of a missed opportunity. But I understand that for some it just feels like it's too difficult because there's too much vocabulary. Um, we are also made aware that there's lots of um, training available on the Pearson website for anyone who wants to use it, and it's free um, to use for teachers. There is, for instance, a conversation recorded with Eric Dier, who is a footballer, and that can be used when you want to talk about diversity with your students. Then we had um, someone who's 
again, very experienced teacher, Isabel Jones, who um, has been a head of MFL, um, a second in department and a classroom teacher for more than 30 years. And her focus was also on vocabulary because she did remind us that when you learn language, you start with the words before you even think about the grammar. You start saying um, cerveza or you start saying um, schnitzel. You start with words and then you build up. So 90% of our knowledge um, is um, when you want to read a text, you need 90% of the word to be able to make sense of it. So it means that if you don't have enough vocabulary, you won't be able to get the, um, the meaning of the text. And that applies for English as well. So if your students have very low variety of vocabulary in English, they won't be able to understand a text relating to geography or history or any other subjects they do at school. So it's really important we increase the vocabulary of our students. Um, in my school, we have um, an English head of department, um, a head of English department, I should say, who started uh, the word of the day. So she, he sends an email to all the staff and to all the students with a new word. And even though my English is pretty good, he's still teaching me new words. So I think it's a great opportunity. And you could do that in your school, or you could also ask the students to provide one word a week for the word of the day. So it is always good to remind children that learning vocabulary is essential, uh, drilling the vocabulary is essential to make sure it sticks in the mind, and uh, wor working on word consciousness. So I like that term, word consciousness. It's teaching the students that words have a history. Words don't just appear out of the blue. People invent them all the time. Remember, uh, in 2015, I think, we invented the word chillaxing. So we always invent new words and it's good to, to teach the students how plastic words are. If you take the root word, as I said earlier, you can add a prefix and a suffix and it becomes a new word. So it's good to show it in another language. As I said, with the, um, the root word égal, you can make égalité, égalitaire, également. Uh, so lots and lots of variations. So Isabel Jones recommended using Etim Online, E-T-I-M-O-N-L-I-N-E dot com. If you want to teach your students how to know more about the etymology of word, and she recommends um, f to motivate the students to use morphology and show them how you can build words the way they used to build with Lego bricks. Um, so she advised us for, for using many activities such as look at these words, what's the common base word, root word, or um, build as many words as you can, or investigate, for instance, find out where the word irksome comes from, such so, something like that. And to solidify retention, because this is the hardest thing, and um, I know lots of people are going to think you are a linguist, you love languages, so obviously it's easy for you. You don't understand how difficult it can be for some students. I actually know how difficult it is to memorize. I'm learning a new language in my 40s. My brain is not as plastic as it used to be, and it's a difficult language that has no link to my mother tongue. I'm learning Danish, so I know how hard it is to look at words that have absolutely no similarity to the words you're familiar with, and the pronunciation is really different. So I, I, I walk in my students' shoes, and I understand how hard it is, and that's why I advise them to use um, memorizing apps. There's some very good ones that I'm not going to quote, because that would be advertising, uh, but you know which one I'm talking about. So use uh, um, these apps every day. If you want to be a li lifelong learner, they're really good to drill vocabulary. Um, so we also had um, we also had a mention of a model that I was not familiar with, which is the Freya model. And I'm thinking it's a very good tool. This is what I love about going to training, even if it's during my weekend, during my free time, is that I learn new things all the time. So the Freya model is um, 
composed of four boxes. You have the word in the middle, for, for instance, the word reptile, and then you need to give information on the characteristics of reptile in one box. In another box, you need to give an uh, example of animals that are not reptiles. Um, in another box, you need to give a sentence about reptiles. And then in the last box, you need to give a very good definition of what a reptile is. So the frame model given to a child could really encourage them to write more and to think about um, meaning. And I think it could be quite a fun game. You could do it in English and then ask the students to do it in the language they are learning. So, for, in, for example, with the reptile in the characteristic, you would have cold-blooded, um, dry, scaly skin, um, ha lays eggs. In the non-example of reptiles, you could have mammals, because obviously they're not reptiles. In the um, example of a sentence with the reptiles, you could say... Um, the snake, the green snake is a reptile. And then in the definition, you would have a cold blooded air breathing animal that scales instead of hair feathers and lays eggs. So if you, if you give that example and then you ask the students to translate it, that could be a language task. And after a while, you could also ask them, um, you could just say French food and then they would have to do a frame model for the French food as homework. So it's always good to have these little tips and strategies that have been used by teachers many years and that they're happily sharing for free for everybody else. Um, she also advised the fact that she uses the frame model. Isabel Jones uses the frame model for Spanish and she teaches the children that um, accents, for instance. So she would say, uh, what is a Spanish accent? When is it used in the characteristics? For instance, it's only on vowels. Uh, there can only be one per word, etc. So I think I'm going to use it uh, with my students. Um, we also are still very much aware that um, it's going to be even more difficult for students with uh, special educational needs such as dyslexia and dys. Uh, orthographia, um, because for them, writing and reading can be difficult. So we need to give them support in that sense. We had another um, person who came as a speaker who was not um, a teacher, but someone who provides resources and one of our sponsors for that event. And that was Mel Pickrell for uh, OUP. So Mel was um, telling us about the resources that are available for teachers. She mentioned there was VIF in French uh, textbook, there was ECHT in German and CLARO in Spanish. So um, the offer is really good now nowadays because for all the languages you have um, on Kabuto, you have an online version and then you have a paper version for students and a paper version for teachers and there's quizzes etc and all the things that teachers need are on on the on offer so you've got phonics grammar using teach te uh, the the target language you are you have metacognition worksheets um a mix of paper and digital use and also the option to record yourself as homework. So it's really great to see how the publishing industry has embraced digital learning because we might need to do more flexible teaching with a mix of face-to-face uh, -face and online. So I think it's, it's really good. I personally looked at the VIF manual and I checked to see if it matched uh, my di my very high diversity criteria. And I was really impressed, actually. There was um, some famous mixed race French personality in the world of basketball. There was uh, lots of um, uh, children on photograph who were not uh, Caucasian looking. So I think all the messaging that's been growing over 
the last decade about um, diversity, inclusion, etc., was really, really followed this time. Now, what I would love to see in the future is a little bit more about uh, people with disabilities, because I haven't seen any uh, pictures of kids with disabilities in the manual so far. I think this is um, this is coming, but we need to also show um, that we are not all um, the same and we are all equal nonetheless. So um, if you're wondering when you can start buying resources for the next um, exam, the next GC exam, they will be available uh, to buy for September and they will be ready, I think, ready in March. So you can ask your head of MFL if you can have a little bit of more budget for that if you're interested in purchasing. Now, obviously, um, we are still thinking about assessment and this was another speaker, um, someone who was obviously not as experienced as <laughs> other speakers because it was um, uh, Ruth Coupland, who had just finished um, her ECT year, so she was uh, a new teacher, and I'm really happy that we let uh, and encourage new teachers to come and speak at these events, because usually newly qualified teachers have lots of good ideas. They've just done the training, they're fresh out of uh, the um, either university or wherever they did their PGC, and they're still enthusiastic and optimistic and bursting with energy. So we need more um, young new teachers to come and speak and share their practice. So um, it was really good to see how they focused on assessment. Um, and they, they looked at uh, different ways to assess students. They recommended two exams per year, two mock exams per year, but also checking for understanding um, several times per lesson and checking for learning every two lessons. And they recommended the use of whiteboards, um, breaking down the meaning of the lesson or the, the structure in little chunks and asking the students to talk to one another during a think pair share so that they can really check if they understood the knowledge. And constantly drilling and revising and checking if everything is clear in the mind. But the, the best uh, advice, I think, that Mrs. Copeland gave was to break down um, every writing task you give to the children, because we noticed since COVID, they feel overwhelmed and then they become a little bit apathetic and they don't start the task. Whereas if you just break it, it's just a visual thing. Instead of giving them a paragraph of instruction, just give them one line and put three blank, um, three horizontal line that they have to fill, and then the other instruction, etc., so that they don't feel so overwhelmed. Um, and also using feedback to make sure that everybody has understood. And this is actually something we skip sometimes due to lack of time, but feedback is the best way to realize where we have made mistakes and how to avoid them in the future. And then there was some. Um, other speakers, male speakers, I think it's really good as well to encourage uh, gender equality representation in MFL. This is a very feminized field. Um, so we need male uh, voices in modern foreign languages. So we had James Maxwell, who is a head teacher principal in a grammar school in Northern Ireland in Belfast. And um, he just wanted to share his passion for languages. Um, he's a very, very uh, enthusiastic head teacher, you can tell. And he was saying that we need to, to really be aware that not all our students are equal and that with our current educational system, it seems like the, the rich students get richer and the poorer children get poorer. It's the Matthew effect, he called it. And uh, we need to be careful because in MFL, it's even more prevalent. The children who have a strong capital knowledge, uh, cultural capital, the children who travel a lot, the children who have family members who live abroad, they start with way more um, data 
than the other students. So we need to make sure the playing field is um, leveled so that all our students can get as much as possible from our teaching. So we need to be proficient in responsive teaching, according to James Maxwell. We need to keep everybody working, make sure that everybody's engaged and making sure that everybody's practicing, not just the strong ones who are very vocal and very enthusiastic about languages, but everybody. And um, yeah, we, we need also to let students have enough time to remember and not rush into giving them an answer. I think spoon feeding is definitely um, something I notice a lot in the UK. Um, it comes from a very good intention, but you know that's also the way to hell that's paved with good intentions. So we need to step back sometimes and tell the children how to get the information, but not give them the information. Um, now, we had also um, another tip that James Maxwell recommended, and I would only use it with high achievers in the language lesson because I think this is where I saw a big difference between my student cohort and James Maxwell's student cohort. Uh, obviously he's in a grammar school so it's students who are very academic. So uh, James Maxwell had a little uh, system where he would put a mistake in his um, in his papers and he would ask the children as in a where is Wally type of bonus to find and isolate and define what the mistake was. I would not do that with my students because I think a lot of them would end up learning the mistake and taking it for granted. So maybe if I really make a super obvious mistake, but you know, I, I don't think that would work with my students. But I mean a salute the the idea and if you have a top set i would say go for it tell them that where is where's the mistake um and then we had um someone who is also quite experienced but someone who teaches german which is a, a change because all the other speakers were um either uh, French or Spanish speakers. So we, we left the Latin languages and we went into the, the German one with Sylvia Sisa. So um, she's a subject leader in German and she wanted to focus on developing efficacy in listening. So again, listening is a very difficult task that implies micro skills such as decoding and a lexical recognition so there's a few ideas that we can put in place but it's about preparation so we need to tell our students that they need to be independent learners and they need to do the work at home and they can't rely on the teacher it goes with a spoon feeding problem we need to make the students understand the teachers can't make you revise everything you have to do it yourself at home as well and um she also recommended using um, radio listening to get used to having only um, the, the audio file but not the visual cues because that is very tricky. And um, she also reminded us that when someone listens to someone who is speaking, the listener is uh, always just one syllable behind, so 0 0.25 seconds later and behind the speaker. So it's it's an intense thing to actually hear a message and then to decode it and then to answer questions about it. It's a very, very, very um, difficult task. So we need to uh, uh, really prepare our students and practice makes perfect. Now, the limits of a listening exam or a listening practice is that you don't always get to hear accents and anyone knows that if you hear someone from Birmingham or from Glasgow or from Devon, they will have very different accents. Um, intonation, and also if a, the, the speaker is a male or female, their voices might be very different. So this is all the difficulties that children face when they do a listening for their exams. Accent, intonation, gender of speaker and the time limit, which makes it usually the most dreaded part of the language exam. So her advice and her tips, uh, Sylvia Sisa recommended breaking tasks down in chunks, working on motivation, positive mindset, 
practicing listening from year seven, using songs and music, um, practice listening to one another. And I mean, all over the country, we need to teach ourselves from the House of Lords to nursery. We need to teach ourselves to listen to one another actively. Um, using speed adjusting makes it a little bit easier nowadays. Teaching phonics in context, not in isolation, is also a very good tip. And uh, identifying sounds, phonemes, and working hard on pronunciation. Because if you don't teach your students how to pronounce properly, they won't be able to understand the word when they hear it. So if your children come and say, um, bonjour, tell them, mm -mm, bonjour correct them. Same with uh, students saying the color rojo in Spanish. Don't, don't let them get away with saying rojo. That's not acceptable. We need high expectation. We need them to understand it's rojo. And if they don't practice it, they won't be able to recognize it when they hear it. So we need to be really nitpicking with pronunciation to help with listening. Um, for sound strategies, um, putting it in minimal pairs, putting words in a sequence and identifying the keyword or the cognate were also the tips that she gave. Another speaker who was fresh out of um, training and again, enthusiastic, energetic new teacher, lovely to meet, was Sophie Mills. And um, she wanted to share how we we can enjoy the beauty of uh, studying a written text. So that's for people who are um, working on languages, but also in English. I mean, text is um, one of the most important thing that we, we can study in, in the classroom. So she said it was a whole department strategy she did in her classroom. And they, she noticed that her students lacked that that cultural capital I mentioned, and they didn't know how to structure a paragraph. Some forget to put a capital letter at the beginning of a sentence and put a dot at the end, a full stop. So it's really important to model using text that's already made. So she always used the I do, you do, we do, I do, we do, you do. Um, her advice was use a text, exploit it to the bone, pull it apart, break it down, highlight it, find the family, uh, the semantic fields, um, highlight the verbs, highlight the time markers. Really, um, it, it's like doing an autopsy of a text and then really look at the bone and the structure. And then you can use that model to write your own text. And it doesn't matter if it's very, very, very resembling it's almost a copy because this is by copy that we become better. So she also uh, said one of the activities we can add once we've um, peeled all the layers of that text is gap fill dictation, translating, and then with the support of a word mat, we can produce very good writing. She said the outcomes was positive. There was less repetition of the same words. So the classic boring and interesting combo. Um, the students were confident, it improved their confidence and it removed one of the barriers of the exercise. So definitely a strategy that any teacher can use, whether in English or in any other languages. And then we had someone who was um, a doctor, so Dr. Polly Duxfield, um, who really uh, raised the bar and made it sound very much like um, a PhD introduction to a thesis. So Polly Duxfield is head of MFL and she came to talk to us about verbalizing thoughts in A-level MFL, a metacognitive approach to teaching translation. So what did she want us to know? It was about translation and she knew that it was a daunting task for students. She acknowledged again in accordance with Helen Myers that it is very harshly marked by the example under the guidance of the Department for Education and of course, and that too often it was an excuse in order to do a glorified grammar test. So she wanted to um, work on the notion that um, translation can be something that we learn to appreciate more. So she advised to read the whole text, 
um, and then to break it down in chunks. Again, this is an advice that comes regularly. Break it down because it's easier to climb up the mountain if you climb up in different stages and then you have base camp and then you have a higher camp, etc. So uh, this is the end of my Everest analogy, by the way. Divide the text. Uh, look at time markers with a with a highlighter. Um, ensure that you um, identify the tenses used. Make sure the teacher first translates the first sentence as an I can do it. Now let's do it together for the second sentence. And then third, you do it on your own. So we really hold the students by the hand. And I think it's about confidence building. So she, this is what she recommended to start the students on a more positive outlook uh, towards um, learning to translate the text. But before I get to the next speaker, we're going to listen to another set of news. I'll see you in a few minutes. Teaching is a rewarding profession, but it comes with its fair share of challenges. That's where ADAPT come in. We're not your typical trade union, but instead a modern, apolitical alternative offering expert legal, employment and mental health support. Protection without the politics. So what makes EDAPT different? We're always apolitical and independent, specialised solely in supporting individual teachers. Our caseworkers are professionally qualified, ensuring you always get the best advice. Plus, there's 24-7 mental health support. Whether it's a simple contract check or handling serious allegations, EDAPT are here for you. Join the thousands of educators who've chosen Edapt to protect their careers. Subscribe at edapt.org.uk today. Edapt. Supporting school staff. Protecting careers. All right, so that was our announcer. Um, I just want to go back to the event that happened in Manchester on Saturday. This was the first modern foreign languages face-to-face -face event with Teach Meet, and the sponsors were Pearson and Oxford University Press. The point of these conferences and meetings is that teachers can actually hear other teachers reflecting on what they do best but also on the difficulties they face and they give each other very pragmatic tips what i really enjoyed the most was when teachers said oh this is a very good way of practicing a skill with your students and i think it it is the most efficient and the best quality of cpd you can get it's not always something that is imposed by your own school. You go there willingly and it's targeted to your practice because too often you're told things that are supposed to work in every lesson, such as DT, maths, but it's not transferable. MFL is very specific, so it's essential to attend these meetings. Now, the following speaker was myself but you know me by now and if you want to know more about what i do which is uh, talking about decolonizing the curriculum there has been a podcast on teachers talk radio that you can listen to i want to talk now about the following speaker and that was connor o'boyle another uh, teacher who came from um, Northern Ireland. And uh, Connor is also a MFL teacher. He's a head of French and you could tell he was very passionate about the language. Um, he's um, challenging us to use authentic text, something I'm really in favour of and that I have done in the past but I need to bring it back into my practice because you know good habits get lost very quickly. So this type of training is good to remind you of all the very powerful little things you can do to make your lessons more fun. So Connor is using uh, real storybooks, which obviously are classic that everybody's using in nursery and then primary school, but you can use it in secondary because the language is actually easier to grasp for someone who is exposed to that language um, for the first time. So he's using um, something called the Fa Fable Cottage, so www.thefable Cottage, and uh, these are storybooks that he prepared. He's using it with year seven, but you can also use it with year nine, depending on the level of your students. These are authentic. Maybe he's adapted them sometimes to use a cognate 
a cognate word rather than a word that's hard to decipher, but is is kind enough to share it with us. So this was the story of a little chicken going on some adventures. And I think it's really good to make the students read it out loud. As a homework, they could record themselves pronouncing it and you could give them feedback on their pronunciation. You can do um, translation activities, but you can also do cognate searches, vocabulary race, and um, tense analysis. You don't have to read the whole book in one session, you can do one page per week, but what matters is that you focus on phonics and pronunciation. And uh, you can also adapt the text, as I said, and pre-teach the vocabulary if there's too many words that are difficult or that are not in the topics you've been covering. Um, this is a very good idea and I wish everybody could use one storybook. I advise also to use the translated version of famous ones. I know The Rainbow Fish and um, The Little Caterpillar are very good storybooks that everybody knows, so you can use the French version for, of it. If you want to add more cultural capital, then you can look at some fun storybooks um, Obviously, they might look a little bit childish, childish for teenagers, but you'd be surprised how proud they would be if you record them and, and then they can say, oh, I'm able to read a whole actual French book. Um, so we're coming to um, the end of uh, this podcast. I just wanted to uh, answer the question, the original question of the podcast. It's, it was, why do teachers need um, quality training? Well, the question is obviously because it helps them in their practice, but it's not just that. This is a difficult job where you're always alone. When you think of it, the teacher is always facing 25 to 30 students, usually in um, positive relationship, but not all the time. Sometimes there's a lot of confrontation, particularly when you have teenagers going through hormonal changes. So it is a very lonely job. Sometimes I never see my colleagues. I just wave at them in the corridor as I rush to the toilet or rush to the printer. And that's the only interaction I have with other adults. So it is even more important that we make space and we give time for teachers to access good quality training. And good quality training is when teachers who are teaching the same subject can come together and share their tips and experience. But as I said, the teach meet icon face to face event was really important because it was trying to be inclusive and diverse we had uh, male teachers talking we had uh, retired teachers talking we had freshly hired new teachers talking we had different types of teachers teachers in grammar schools teachers in state schools with a lot of deprivation so it was a, a very good diverse panel and I think it represented the reality of our job. And also it gave us exactly what we needed, some time to be together, to share and to build a better practice. So I want to thank everybody who um, listens to this podcast, everybody who attended the face-to-face uh, -face event. And I want to encourage anyone who wants to attend them please do so. It's really enriching, really fulfilling, and you will feel much happier when you leave, despite having taught a whole week in difficult circumstances. So this is all for me. Um, I'm thanking my dear listeners for following me after 50 podcasts. What a number. Um, and where does time go? So I'm going to do a special podcast next week to celebrate. I haven't decided the subject yet, but I'm thinking it will be um, enriching and interesting. Have a lovely Sunday evening and I hope you feel rested to start a new week. Thank you. Teaching is a rewarding profession, but it comes with its fair share of challenges. That's where ADAPT come in. We're not your typical trade union, but instead a modern, apolitical alternative, offering expert legal, employment and mental health support. Protection without the politics. So what makes ADAPT different? We're always apolitical and independent, specialised solely in supporting individual teachers, 
our caseworkers are professionally qualified, ensuring you always get the best advice. Plus, there's 24-7 mental health support. Whether it's a simple contract check or handling serious allegations, EDAPT are here for you. Join the thousands of educators who've chosen EDAPT to protect their careers. Subscribe at edapt.org.uk today. EDAPT. Supporting school staff. Protecting careers. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.